Today, uh, we begin a sort of new era in our physics. Uh, and so it makes sense to pause for a moment and appreciate how far we've come in our study of describing motion in terms of the kinematics, position, velocity, and acceleration, describing the nature of the alteration of the motion, the context of Newton's laws and using Newton's second law to describe the evolution of mechanical systems in time. And along the way, we discover there are some generalizing principles and symmetry, like the conservation of energy, conservation of momentum, and conservation of angular momentum. And uh, we've explored those things rather deeply, but there's still more to discuss. <clears throat> there's uh, more of interest. Uh, but for now, we're going to move on to another aspect of our classical science, that is classical physics. Um, and I just want to say right here at the beginning that the way that I choose to approach, it, approach, it, approach this, <clears throat> pardon me, it, or the way that I organize it in my mind, is in more of an experimental context that I observe the nature of things that I seek to describe. Now, when we first began talking about physics, that's what I say, isn't it? That physics is a description of the universe. And so when I encounter new phenomena, then I describe those. In mean, the history of our human science, a lot of effort went into describing the nature of light and gravitation and the motions of mechanical objects, marbles rolling down ramps or what have you. Um, but there was an aspect of the nature of things that was sort of, I suppose you could say, a late bloomer in our science, in that it was experimentally observed rather early, um, but the explanations came rather late, uh, significantly after uh, the time of Isaac Newton. And what I'm referring to, of course, is the electromagnetic interactions um, which is going to be our course of study for the, for the next uh, many weeks. Um, and so, uh, just to start us off here, I've created for you here this demonstration. It will sort of uh, underline what it is that I'm describing. Here I've hung from the ceiling these two balloons, and I think some of you coming in realized uh, a rather curious thing about it. As you look... <clears throat> The balloons uh, are each hanging from a string. And I'll assume, of course, that they're equal mass uh, and that they have the same properties. Of course, their colors are different, but that's not going to, if I were to investigate that, I would discover that the color was not relevant to the nature of the thing. But the curious thing you can all see is that whereas I would expect the balloons to hang from the ceiling directly below the support point with the force of gravity acting down and the tension of the string acting upward, I would imagine that they hang straight down. You can see here that the two balloons are deflected toward one another, albeit slightly. But they're not hanging vertically, but each one uh, is hanging uh, with a slight bit of deflection. Now, the free body diagram for this description is one that we've drawn uh, previously in our mechanics, a free body diagram of some interest. With the tension force at an angle, I'll resolve that tension to its components and discover that for the balloon on the left, there must be some force directed to the right that is causing the deflection. And for the balloon on the right, there must be some force directed to the left that is the cause of the deflection. You might be sitting there thinking to yourself, well, this is not surprising at all because, you see, we understand that between all objects that have mass, and presumably the balloons have mass, between all objects that have mass, there is a force of attraction and you see that force of attraction accounts for the deflection of the masses from their otherwise vertical equilibrium positions. And that's a pretty good analysis because we understand, according to Newton's second law, that it's the natural tendency of objects to persevere in their motions. That is, they should exhibit inertial behavior. And that if I observe those behaviors, I should find natural constraints or conditions that are the cause of any alteration of motion. So when I see a balloon deflected to the left or deflected to the right, then I look for the force that is the cause. And you run through a list of all of the forces that you happen to be aware of today, and you say, well, there's no connection between the two. There's no string connecting or whatever. Uh, and there, nobody's from, there are no external forces acting. The strings from which they're supported cannot exert forces uh, that way. So you say, well, it's a reasonable thing. I already know that the moon is attracted to the earth by a force inversely proportional to the square of the distance in between. So you see, I figured it out now. It's a gravitational force of attraction between the two balloons. And I don't fault you for that analysis. Except with a little bit of experimental verification, we'll take the balloons down, we'll determine their masses. 
uh, we'll measure the distance between them before we take them down. They'll do the experiment in the correct order. <clears throat> and we'll calculate how much gravitational force, and we'll immediately discover that the gravitational force between the balloons is so impossibly small, so incredibly small, that it cannot account for the, the, for the deflection. This is sort of a remarkable thing, because there's a way of using Newton's laws that we've actually referred to before when we first encountered them, that not only can I use them to describe the behavior of physical systems in the context of forces of which I am already familiar, but also when I see a system behave in an odd sort of way that I cannot explain, that it's an indication according to Newton's first law that I may very well have discovered a new force and indeed that's what's happened. Because the interaction between the two balloons that is causing the attraction is actually electrical in nature. Just like universal gravitation, there's a tremendous amount of history behind these discoveries because they happened over many centuries. And when I have a classroom full of students such as yourselves, those students come, particularly after already taking courses in chemistry and have, having had some exposure to the natural sciences, my students already know quite a bit about the nature of electricity fundamentally in the context of atoms and the electrons and protons and neutrons that compose those um, structures. And so it's a little bit difficult to talk about it in this context, but here uh, is uh, sort of a, I'm going to sort of do a basic outline about it without getting too deep. I'm deba Hopefully, I'm simply going to describe to you the interesting bits. Well, what happened historically, and it's part of the reason why the electrical phenomenon was not deeply understood um, until later in our science, and by later I mean the later 1700s, early 1800s, uh, is because the effects were discovered but very mysterious because of the invisibility of the cause. Uh, and I, as soon as I said that, I immediately thought back to the fact that Isaac Newton was able to describe the force of gravity between objects, but he did not understand, and it would have been a great mystery to him, how it is that two objects, such as the moon and the earth, could exert gravitational forces the one upon the other without any physical connection in between. He would have had some imaginings, and he might have written specifically about them, but he would have had some imaginings, that there is some invisible nature, something unseeable about that. Well, what would happen back in the day is... Uh, through industry and the, the crafting of materials for the purpose of societal advance and, and you know, just <laughs> making a profit, uh, some phenomena are observed, natural phenomena are observed in the course of human events. For example, pine tree uh, releases sap in a liquid form that when it becomes fossilized is a material known as amber. And ancients found quite a few very good uses um, for the material known as amber. But one thing that was discovered was that a piece of amber, uh, when rubbed vigorously with certain materials, and in particular, just to be specific about it, um, the fur of an animal, for example, would exhibit some strange physical properties. For example, there could be static electric discharges, the kind that you encounter on a Sunday afternoon when you're moping around the house in your bunny slippers and you touch a doorknob and experience that but also that a force of attraction could be observed, much like we've done here with the balloons, where a piece of amber rubbed with a piece of fur could pick up small uh, metallic objects, manipulate uh, bits of paper. And these phenomena were observed, but they were quite mysterious because if I take a piece of amber and I rub it with a piece of fur, there is no measurable physical change that I can see. If I had a way, as an ancient scientist, if I had a way to make measurements of the mass very sensitively, I would discover that there was, would appear to be no change in mass, that there was no change in color, there's very likely no smell involved, and, and very little to get experimental traction on. So this sort of amber phenomenon <clears throat> uh, was uh, mysterious. By the way, just as an aside, uh, is very interesting little factoid. The word amber, uh, well, the Greek word for amber, uh, and this is almost like a great spoiler of the history of this. The Greek, ancient Greek word for amber, amber uh, is electron, which is where the naming of the whole field of electricity, um, electronics, 
and the nature of the electron itself as a subatomic particle. It's where all that naming comes from, from this resinous amber <clears throat> that was uh, collected. And so the knowledge uh, of the understanding of the thing was limited. And here's, so here's what, we, we, what you would do. The rubbing of materials together to create the electrical effect is um, basically we now refer to that as the triboelectric effect, that frictional interaction between substances causes um, the electrical effect. So here's what you would do. Uh, and this was what was observed. <clears throat> uh, well, I'll, I'll sort of summarize this as being the ancient sort of view of this science. If I have a glass rod here <clears throat> and I rub the glass rod with silk, uh, then I discover that I create some electrical effect. That is, those effects that are observed of mysterious invisible forces uh, taking place, that's observed. When I rub glass with silk, but also if I have uh, here a rod of amber and I rub it with fur, then I also get that effect. Well, there's a curious thing about that. <clears throat> is that if I have the glass rod and I have the amber rod and I prepare them in this way, I discover that their electric uh, effects have um, uh, a different uh, sense to them. That is, whereas in one case I might get attractive forces, in another case I get repulsive forces. That there seems to be a fundamental difference in the nature between the two. And so the glass um, triboelectrical effect here was described initially as vitreous electricity, or vi the vitreous effect, the word vitreous being etymologically related to gl the glass uh, and transparency, translucency. So if I rub glass with silk, I get a kind of vitreous electricity, and if I rub uh, amber with fur, I get resinous electricity, amber being a resin. So there's a belief that there are two forms going on here. And so the idea is that when you perform this action of triboelectric preparation of these materials, that uh, it changes their nature and gives them a property of vitreousness or resinousness, that there are two aspects to it. Well, <clears throat> and again, I'm, I'm abbreviating the history here because we're interested in getting to the technical aspects of things. But our own hometown hero, Benjamin Franklin, played a big role in getting this um, straightened out. Benjamin Franklin, of course, one of the founding fathers of the um, United States, um, was involved in so much. If you read the biography on Benjamin Franklin, I can't remember the author at the moment, the great biography of Benjamin Franklin, you discover uh, that he was a statesman and he was also very much an industrialist and he invented many um, ways of structuring uh, human society. He's also a scientist, uh, and we learn from a very, very early age about Ben Franklin's experimentation with electricity. Well, the key idea here is that Benjamin Franklin realized that there were not two forms of electricity. He imagined it instead that there were two, that there was one electrical property, and that the electrical property was simply being described in terms of its presence or absence. This is the idea that Ben Franklin had, that basically all objects are neutral in their electrical effect. And that makes sense because as an everyday experience, you would go around and would not observe electrical phenomenon in just everyday objects. So in this sense, they're neutral and they have no electrical effect. But what he proposed was that when I rub a glass rod with silk, the electrical property is then separated, leaving the glass rod to be electrically active <clears throat> or electrified. Similarly, and the reason for it, he figured this out, was that, sure, if I focus on the glass rod, the glass rod becomes electrified, but so too does the silk become electrified. But it becomes electrified in the opposite way. So what the way that <clears throat> Franklin viewed this was that the glass rod and the silk are neutral, but through the triboelectric process of preparing these items, that the electrical effect was separated. That in one object, it was the absence of the electrical property that caused its electric electrification, and that in the other object, it was the excess of the electrical property that caused its electrification. Now, Benjamin Franklin, of course, had no idea 
that there were subatomic particles. He had no idea that those existed. Um, the atomic hypothesis was very different. Um, <clears throat> and so he did not appreciate the exchange of charged particles. This is what I say about teaching this material. I'm talking in a historical context about the discovery, but I have students who appreciate the fact that it's the exchange of charged particles that's going on. Let's hold on to that thought for just a moment and continue with Ben Franklin's observations here before I become more specific and our discussion becomes technical as we all hope that it will. So there's a single electrical property and there, and it, that exists in neutrality in nature, but it can, through friction, be separated. And the electrical effect should be described in the context of a surplus or a, a deficit of the electrical property. So what he did was, uh, and actually, I, I try not to get too grumpy about it, but um, Benjamin Franklin makes a choice here that is extraordinarily arbitrary, and yet, once made, irrevocably creates an annoying um, consequence for the entire future of this science. That is, he says that when I, when I rub a, a, a glass rod with silk, that the glass rod becomes positive electrically. And therefore, the silk has the opposite electrical sense and is therefore negative. Saying positive and negative as a replacement for saying vitreous or resinous, because he wants to give one name and one algebraic sense and one variable that can be positive or negative to describe the electrical effect. By doing that arbitrarily and not understanding the nature of subatomic particles, Benjamin Franklin inadvertently described electrons as having a negative charge. Before I get into the details, here's what happens. When I take a glass rod and I rub it with silk, the silk strips electrons off the glass which are easily removed. In a moment, I'm going to describe the properties of electrons and protons that make this a sensible idea. But electrons are stripped by friction off of the glass rod, meaning that where they were both previously electrically neutral, the silk is negatively charged by virtue of an excess of electrons, and the glass rod is now positively charged by virtue of a deficit of electrons. And so the electron transfer, I show here on my diagram, the electron transfer goes from the glass to the silk. In the case of the fur and the amber, it's the opposite. When I rub fur on amber, electrons are easily removed from the fur, and so electrons are transferred to the amber, making the amber negatively charged in the excess. But now electrons have been removed from the fur, formerly neutral, and those removed electrons leave the fur with a net positive charge. And so by making this observation about positives and negatives, um, to a certain extent, uh, Ben Franklin did a number on us, and I'm going to refer to it um, quite a few times uh, in our course of study here in the coming weeks about that negative um, and how it persists. But there was another feature to this. Um, that Ben Franklin not only identified that there was only one electrical property, but he also made this observation. Imagine that I prepare an object, I'll just draw a circle here, call this object A and object B, and I prepare them in such a way that their electrical interaction is attracted, much like these balloons here that I did in the demonstration. So I prepare them in such a way that, there's, that they're, it's attractive. I can do that. If I prepare a second object here, here that I call C. So I have object A and B, which attract each other. And I have another object here that I call C. If I discover that that object C is also attracted to B, then I will discover that A and C will repel each other. You see, there's a kind of logic to the interaction between positive and negatively charged objects. It's simply expressed. Objects of opposite electrical charge attract, and objects of like electrical charge repel. That's a difference between the electrical interaction and the force of gravity, for example. In all the investigations that we've done 
of gravitation in our previous course, we discover that gravity is always an attractive force. Uh, but here, I discover that the electrical interaction can be both attractive and repulsive. So it turns out Benjamin Franklin, famous historical figure, accomplished a great deal, again, without appreciating the nature of the charged particles. Well, now I'm going to have a more modern discussion and appreciate the fact that the electrical interaction is somehow associated with the behavior of charged particles that I've studied in significant depth in chemistry and perhaps in other ways which I've engaged in the physical science. The electrical interaction is associated with a property of matter called electric charge. Now, it's not going to help me solve any problems, but I, there's a kind of thinking that I would like you to have. I would like you to appreciate the fact that the gravitational interaction between massive objects in the universe is associated with the property of matter that we call mass. Yes, it's true that I have described mass as the measure of an object's inertia. It turns out that inertia and gravity are linked in this way. But what I'm specifically referring to is that if I see two objects mutually gravitating each other, for example, the Earth and the Moon, when I see that mutual gravitation, I might ask the question, what is it about the Earth and the, ma and the Moon that is the cause of the gravitational attraction? Well, the answer might be that, you see, these objects have a property called mass. And the mass of objects scales the gravitational attraction. Well, that, uh, that idea is obviously incomplete. It requires more explanation. Why does the property of mass produce this? What is the nature of it? And of course, the story does not end with Isaac Newton, but continues on uh, to uh, Albert Einstein and the general theory of relativity, uh, topics that we'll take up at a later date. The electric charge is just that. I see a phenomenon, in this case, a phenomenon of attraction where two balloons attract each other. Um, and I need to explain it. Well, I explain it in the context of a natural property that they have that is not their mass, but instead their electric charge. When it comes to mass, I'm going to give you a, an example here. It turns out through careful experimentation, I mean very careful because it's no easy trick to do, but the mass of a proton which, of course, is the, the ultimate nuclear particle, the positively charged particle that, together with neutrons, comprises the nucleus of atoms. The proton has a mass that is 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms. That is an extraordinarily small mass. But it turns out the mass of the electron is even smaller, 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. An electron has an extraordinarily small mass. It's possible that you may have wondered at some point, particularly diagrams that you've been shown, where the nucleus of an atom composed of its protons and neutrons um, is together as a, as a tight ball of mass, and electrons are whirling about um, in what look very much like planetary orbits. Um, and it's not often <laughs> explained to students when they first see that description that while there are some features of that description, that, that an atom is like a system of planets, uh, like a solar system, while there are a few advantages to that description, it is extraordinarily incomplete and completely and inadequate for describing the nature of atomic behavior. It turns out we need an entirely new branch of physics to describe that, and of course that's quantum mechanics, and we'll have to wait uh, for our third course before we engage in that. You cannot imagine atoms as solar systems. But imagine that you did and said, well, you see, it works the same way. The sun is very massive, and the Earth is very comparatively small mass, and so the Earth goes around in orbit around the sun in the way that we've described in significant detail. Well, then you try to do the same calculation and imagine how you could have the nucleus of an atom and an individual electron goes around in an orbit, and you find that the force of gravitational attraction between a proton and an electron is absurdly small. So small that it cannot account for atomic, it's not even close to accounting for atomic structure. And you realize that the interaction between protons and electrons is not gravitational. In fact, if I study the behavior of molecules and atoms and whatnot, if, I, if I, my career leads me in that direction where I'm working with atoms, I'll discover that I can completely ignore their gravitational interactions. The gravitational interaction, which is in fact the weakest of the fundamental forces of the universe, the gravitational interaction has no sway. What does 
is electrical charge, a property of matter. Just as mass is a property of matter, but be careful. Because charge has some features to it that mass does not. One of the immediate ones that we consider is that there are positive charges and negative charges. It turns out that mass is only positive. And one of the consequences of mass being only positive, an algebraic consequence of that, is that the force of gravity is only attractive. Now, there are some imaginings in cosmology and our modern science about repulsive gravity, but that's not in a Newtonian sense. That's in a, a much broader general relativity cosmological sort of sense. No, gravity is always attractive. Mass is always positive. But charge can be positive or negative. That's Ben Franklin establishing for us that there is a positive and negative sense to electrical interaction. So that's one thing about charge is that it has, there are two senses of charge. You can have negative charge. But another really important feature of electrical charge is that it is quantized. So far as we can tell, in terms of the mass of particles in our universe, a particle can have any mass that it likes. There's quite a bit of investigation that goes on in the field of physics known as particle physics, investigating um, what sort of particles can be created, what the relationships between those particles are, and what phenomena they explain. So far as we can tell, a particle can have any mass that it pleases nature to have. There's no restriction on it. It's not the case for electrical charge because we discover as we break matter down into its smaller and smaller constituents and don't consider a lump of amber, but instead of unction of amber, and then discover that that amber is composed of a variety of molecules and then choose a molecule, and that molecule is composed of atoms and the atoms then of the subatomic particles, we chase the electrical effect all the way down to the, to the <coughs> particle scale, to the subatomic scale, and we discover... <coughs> that there is a smallest possible charge known as the fundamental charge, which is typically given the symbol E. The fundamental charge, E, and that all charges, from the charges associated with atoms and molecules and pure substances and on and on from there, all the way up to the electrical phenomenon described by rubbing objects physically together. <clears throat> all electrical charges, the symbol Q, are an integer multiple of the fundamental charge, E. So here I'm using, I should, I actually have to back up for half a second. I'm using Q as the symbol for charge. M is mass, Q is charge. As we go on through the course, you may find that sometimes I use a lowercase Q and sometimes I use a capital Q um, in the description. Um, it's, it's sort of analogous to using lowercase r for radius or capital R. I'll tend to use lowercase q for a charge that might be variable, that might change in the course of the description of the problem that I'm trying to solve. And I'll generally use capital Q to describe um, charges that will remain constant during the phenomenon or do, during the problem that I'm trying to solve. Although I have to warn you right off the bat that I may break that rule um, at my whim. That's just sort of the way it goes. But the symbol Q is going to stand for electrical charge. And I always have to remember that every time I in introduce a new physical quantity, that I have to provide what the units of that quantity are. Well, the unit of electrical charge is the Coulomb. I'm not sure how familiar, in a minute I'm going to mention a very familiar name, um, but I'm not sure how familiar you are with the, um, not sure how familiar you are with uh, the name Coulomb. Coulomb was uh, the first experimentalist to investigate the magnitude of the force between charged objects. And in a moment, we're going to describe that physical law. But Coulomb is given credit for experimental investigation of the strength of the electrical interaction. And so it's fitting that the unit of charge would be called the Coulomb. It's given the symbol capital C to stand for the Coulomb. And so the idea here is that charge is quantized. You can't have any charge that you want, but charge must be an integer multiple of the fundamental charge. Here's the remarkable thing. An electron, the fundamental particle that we learn about in chemistry and the exchange of those electrons and their interactions in chemistry creates all the chemical structure of the universe. Those electrons have a charge that is equal to the fundamental charge, which is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. 
a spectacularly small number of coulombs. Well, the reason for this is experimental advance. It's difficult to measure the charge of an electron historically. We sort of have to wait for our experimental techniques to advance enough. So where the unit of coulomb comes from initially in terms of a quantity of charge is associated with the experiments of Michael Faraday. And I said that you might be more familiar with the name Faraday because in chemistry class, it was probably described to you, that Faraday did experiments where he would have a solution, typically a salt solution, and he would have two electrodes in there, and he would watch the chemical reaction take place, and he would discover that on one electrode of the apparatus, a certain mineral scale would form, and on the other electrode, a different scale of material would form. But when he investigated the masses of products that were uh, produced in those interactions, he was able to determine that the chemical process was taking place by the exchange of individual units of charge, in his case, individual units of atoms. That is a question of molarity. Because when the experiment takes place, a tremendous amount of atoms are shifted from one place to the other. And so in the experiment, you don't get measurable, precise results unless you measure a lot of charge. And as a result, in that experiment, a coulomb is a fair amount of charge because a large number of charge carriers have been trans, uh, transported. But then a very long time later, like a century later, the experiment gets done again in more of a precise way and the individual charge of an electron can be determined um, by investigators like um, Millikan, for example, historically investigating the fact that an electron has a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. That is the smallest charge that can be found in nature. Here's the amazing thing. While it is true that protons and electrons have significantly different masses. Look here. The mass of the proton is a thousand times larger than the mass of the electron. They have very different masses. They have, so far as we can tell, exactly the same charge. The electron has the fundamental charge, but so too does the proton. They both have the same fundamental charge. Now, electrons and protons have the fundamental charge. Their charges are fundamental. Every other object that exhibits charged behavior that we would like to describe in the nature of things, every other object that exhibits charged behavior gets that charge in the context of some integer multiple of fundamental charge. There's really two ways that we can see the charged electrical phenomenon occur in nature. One is by conduction. And I've already described a perfect example of that where I rub uh, fur on amber or silk on glass and fundamental charge par par particles are actually transferred from one object to the other and as a result an object becomes charged from its neutrality by a surplus or deficit of electrons and that's a point um, that I want to circle back to right here and make and that is that I had pointed out that the, the, fundament, that the, the electron and the proton they both have the fundamental charge but the mass of the proton is much larger than the mass of the electron. The proton is a thousand times more massive. The proton is big and fat, while electrons are very wispy. The result is that under the influence of the same force, electrons will have much larger accelerations. That is, under the influence of the same electrical interaction, electrons will experience accelerations that are a thousand times greater, which is why when we organize the nature of electrical interactions, we discover that we find ourselves describing them all the time in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of the movement of the electrons, because the protons are big and fat, they don't want to move. So the electrons are wispy, whimsical. They go here and there, which is why over here on my triboelectric diagram, I said it's the electrons that are transferred because the electrons are very light, low mass, and they're easily forced to accelerate to other locations in space, whereas the protons very massive, they, re they remain stationary. And so that's why the transfer of electrons is typically used to describe charging by conduction. Take electrons from a place of neutrality and move them to another place. Where they came from is now positive in their absence, and where they arrive is now negative in their presence. So that's one way that a thing can, do, can gain a charge. 
But it's also possible to charge an object by induction. And what that implies is the rearrangement of charges in an object. Imagine that I have a sphere that is completely electrically neutral. That is, it has as much positive charge as negative charge. And that makes sense from a chemical point of view because the atoms from which it is composed contain as many protons as they do electrons. But now here I come with a charged object that I bring in here from the right. And I bring it in, I bring it in closer and closer and closer and closer. And it's electrical effect. It's a charged object. Its electrical effect attracts electrons and repels protons. Well, the protons don't go anywhere. But the charge of a neutral object can be rearranged by external forces so that charge can be separated. That process, which already in your imagination is sophisticated, is termed induction. So these are the two manners in which things can be charged. So once I've established that an object has electrical charge, which I agree now, is more sophisticated than mass, which is just mass. Electrical charge, a bit more sophisticated, but it's still true that there exists an electrical force that I would like to describe because, and I watch me beat the dead horse, physics is a description of the universe. And I see these two balloons attracting each other. I read about all of the experiments that have been done since antiquity where forces have been observed between objects that have been prepared in this manner. And I would like to describe that force. So I need to make a start. What am I going to do? It's not surprising at all, I think, that I might investigate that force in the context of the gravitational force that I already understand. Because when I set the balloons up there and I saw the balloons sort of attract each other, I thought, well, maybe it's gravity. And then I discovered, no, it's not gravity. But only because gravity is too weak. Not because the nature of the gravitational force didn't fit the phenomenon that I was observing. Gravity is simply too weak to describe. The gravitational force, as I'll draw here, here's the Earth. Um, and the moon in orbit around it. The nature of the gravitational force, is, and I'll write it here, the force of gravity is equal to negative capital G, which is the universal gravitational constant, scaling the strength of the gravitational force to this universe, the product of the masses, m1 and m2, divided by the distance between the masses, the, between their centers, squared. There are some mathematical details there that hopefully we recall, because we'll use those in this new um, branch of our physics. And then I have an R hat on the end. Now the negative sign and the R hat imply that that gravitational force is attractive. If I choose the origin of my coordinate system to be the center of the Earth, then R hat points radially outward from the Earth, and then the negative sign means that the force is exerted in the opposite, the direction of R hat, and so I get an attractive force. The reasoning behind that law was twofold. One is that the force of interaction would depend on the property of both objects. And in that case, the property is the mass. If I increase the mass of one object, I increase the gravitational force. But it's also true that if I increase the mass of the other object, similarly, I increase the gravitational force. And so Isaac Newton composed this physical law with the product of the masses here in the numerator, the product of the masses. So that if you increase the mass of one or the other, the force would increase. He also had very good reason, the second bit of reasoning here, that the force should be 1 over the square of the distance. And the reason for that is that there were already phenomena that he understood where the intensity diminished according to the area over which it was distributed. And as a sphere grows in volume, the intensity over the surface diminishes as 1 over the square because the surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared. So, Newton presumed that this would be the nature of the law. And as we know, he did that magnificent thing, inventing the rules of calculus so that he could solve the problem of the trajectory, identified that the motion of the planets around the sun were in fact ellipses, and then whammo, we were assured of the universal gravitational law. Well, that same reasoning might, might apply here. Because if the interaction is caused by a property of matter that now I know is the electrical charge, then two objects attract each other. If I increase the charge of one object, I would imagine that that force of interaction would increase. If I increase the charge of the other object, then I imagine that that force of interaction would increase. And so maybe I can write an electrical force law here, and just like I, I draw the the Earth and the Moon. Let me draw a proton and an electron, maybe. It's the force between those. Maybe it's a proton and electron. It's an electrical interaction between that. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to 
claim that it's like an orbit. I'm not interested in that. All I'm interested in is the force of interaction. So let me start to imagine an electrical force here. Well, the electrical force is going to be equal to the product of the charges. Charge, so I'll say Q1 times Q2, just as in universal gravitation, I said M1 and M2. There's Q1 and Q2. Divided by the distance between their centers squared. Well, it turns out in this new branch of our physics, um, at least at first, the radius of objects is not going to be a big deal. But it is still true that it's the distance between the centers. I'm still going to keep that idea um, sort of mathematically. So the product of the charges divided by the distance between them squared. And um, just like gravitational force, this is a vector force. So in order to imply that direction, I'm going to choose to put an R hat on there again where uh, the r hat is in my coordinate system, the unit vector associated with position. Well, let me choose uh, the proton's position to be the origin of my coordinate system, because I choose. I choose coordinate systems always. I'll choose the proton to be the origin of my coordinate system, and therefore, uh, the r vector points away from the proton toward the electron, and r hat points similarly in that direction. Well, that's no good, because I know that a positive and a negative charge having opposite charges, will attract each other according to this principle observed by Benjamin Franklin, that opposite charges will attract. And so I need the force to be attractive, just like gravity. And so I'm tempted to put a negative sign in front just to turn this thing, turn this force around and make it attractive. But I don't have to do that because it's algebraically going to work out. When I calculate Q1 times Q2, one of those charges is positive and the other is negative. And so an algebraic negative sign will appear because of the choice of assigning algebraic sign to charges. It works out on its own. If Q1 and Q2 have opposite charge, then one number is negative, the other number is positive. It works out negative. I get a negative sign in front which reverses the direction, well, reverses the direction of the force according to the coordinate system that I've chosen, and I get an attractive force. If both Q1 and Q2 are positive, then obviously it works out positive and the force would be repulsive. If Q1 and Q2 are both negative, it still works out positive and the force is repulsive. The algebraic sign, which was just creating a sense of charge in antiquity, is now driving the algebraic reality of this. Now, once Isaac Newton formulated universal gravitational force, it wasn't done because he didn't know what this universal gravitational constant, g, in front of his force law, he didn't know what that would be equal to, because that's an issue of experimental science. Cavendish would have to come along and do a careful torsional balance experiment to work out what g should be, and that value has been refined since then experimentally to be 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th. You remember that, the universal gravitational constant of very, very small constant of proportionality, which contributes to the weakness of the gravitational force. Well, if I presume that the electrical force is proportional to the product of the charges divided by the square of the distance between their centers, well, then I need to take that into a laboratory and do experimentation. First, I need to experimentally verify my two assumptions that the magnitude of the charges multiplied determines. That works out. That's true. That it diminishes as 1 over the square of the distance, I'll find to my satisfaction an experimental investigation that that also is, works out to be correct. Here's the thing. What is the constant of proportionality? Uh, and uh, Cavendish and others were able to experimentally verify that constant, which is actually referred to as Coulomb's constant, because this electrical force law is generally referred to as Coulomb's law. So I write it this way that the electrical force, which is of course a vector, is equal to a constant of proportionality here, which I've called lowercase k. Of course, that's not the spring constant. Of course, it's not the spring constant. There are only so many letters in the alphabet. What am I going to do? That is Coulomb's constant. Q1, Q2 over r squared, r hat. That is my vector force law for electrical force, where this constant, k, Coulomb's constant, is determined by experiment to be 9 times 10 to the 9th, a fantastically larger, remember, universal gravitational constant, 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11th, a very small constant. 
9 times 10 to the 9th, an enormous constant. And the units, what will the units be? Well, you can work that out. Look, the force is in newtons. And then I'll multiply by meters squared. I'll divide by the charge in coulombs squared, because I have charge times charge. And so it's 9 times 10 to the 9th newton meters squared per coulomb squared, an experimentally derived constant. Well, there's a little bit of a spoiler lurking here, a little bit of a secret in our electricity and magnetism. And I, it's an, a secret that I actually encourage you not to investigate too rigorously. It turns out that the Coulomb constant is not fundamental. And in fact, we'll often see the Coulomb constant K written as one over four pi times a different constant. Experimentally derived, but a different constant. One over four pi, that's an epsilon sub zero, epsilon naught, we call that. One over four pi epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulombs squared per newton meter squared. It's called the permittivity of free space. Now, I just put out as a question, just a curiosity. If I know that the coulomb constant K is 9 times 10 to the 9th, and by the way, in your personal experience, when you solve problems, that's the constant you'll use most often in the bitter watches of the night when you're solving electrostatic problems. You'll be plugging in 9 times 10 to the 9th and using that for their calculation. What need do I have to express that in terms of a different constant? Well, the answer to that question is that we have discovered, beyond this discussion, we have discovered that epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, is more fundamental. That is a tremendous curiosity, but I'm making a personal recommendation to you that you not try to investigate that too deeply. Because when we come to the end of our description of electricity and then magnetism, when we come to the end, there's going to be a bit of magic where these things come together and a fundamental nature of our universe will be revealed. And if you look too closely at it right now, I think it's possible that you might spoil the joy of that. And the whole point of this exercise of we coming together and investigating these things is for the joy of it.